First item on the agenda, we are honored to have a visit from Representative Claire Cronin and Senator Walter Timelty. Representative Cronin, do you want to come? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So nice to be here tonight uh, to see you all. Uh, but it's also a bittersweet occasion. And so, Jane Martin, can you come up here, please? <laughs> Jane, thank you. On behalf of the House of Representatives, we wanted to offer you the citation, which I will read for you. And it's be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Jane Martin in recognition of your dedication and commitment to the community through your tenure on the Eastern School Committee and your continued volunteerism with the Eastern Public Schools. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors, and it is offered by me, your state rep, <laughs> and the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo. So, and thank you. Thank you very much. Jane has been... sitting in the audience tonight. We're really fortunate in East End that we've always had a school committee that is understands the big picture, knows how to make good decisions on behalf of the students, and really tries its best to push the district forward. So while I really appreciate this, and I'm very surprised and honored, I couldn't have done anything that I've done without the colleagues I work with now and the colleagues who I've been really blessed to work with in the past. So mm -hmm. that's it. So we're also joined by my colleague, Senator Walter Timothy, who has something from the Senate oh. as well. <laughs> Seriousness and thank you very much, Representative Cronin. Uh, the, the finest institutions we have in our communities, and certainly the most important are our public schools. School committees make that happen. And for years, I've heard about the great quality schools we have in Easton from Representative Cronin long before I had the privilege of representing this community. And since I've had the privilege of representing this community, I've always heard from Representative Cronin what great work the school committee does and what great work you do, Jane. So it was my privilege this week to offer the citation in the State Senate. Honoring you for your great work you. on the Eastern School Committee, the great work for the Eastern Public Schools, a marquee school system. And we also know this is not an end for you. There will be other great works you'll do for this great community. <laughs> this citation states, Commonwealth of Massachusetts State Senate, official citation. Be it known that the Massachusetts State Senate hereby extends its congratulations to Jane Martin in recognition of your dedication and commitment to the community in the town of Easton through your tenure on the Easton School Committee and for your continued volunteerism with the Eastern Public Schools. And be further known that the Massachusetts State Senate extends its best wishes, Jane, for continued success, as I alluded to earlier, this is not an ending, that this citation be duly signed by the President of the Senate and attested to in a copy thereof transmitted by the Clerk of the Senate. It has been signed by our Senate President, Karen Spilka, attested to by Michael Hurley, and offered by myself, Walter Timothy. Congratulations, Jane. For this, I have to say, because it's the least <laughs> literally that we could do. I'm going to miss you so much, but I'm also going to read to you what I actually sent to Faith Simon, who Claire is very um, competent aide, and she told me, you know, it would have to be boiled down to two senses. <laughs> so I started out with two full pages, I ended up with one with good print. Jane Martin's contributions to the Easton Public Schools and to the community of Easton have spanned a period of nearly 20 years, at least. That's just what I know about. Early on, she regularly volunteered in the schools of the children. She eventually took on increasingly larger roles, bringing significant benefits to the entire district. She was active in the 
actively involved in both the 2002 and 2004, 2005 campaigns to debt exclusion overrides to fund the renovation and expansion of Olive Rames High School and Easton Middle School, actually assuming leadership of the second campaign. She has served on the Easton School Committee for over eight years. 2013, and again from September to through the present. During her first two terms, Ms. Martin was either vice chair or chair of the committee for four years. Since June of 2017, as chair of the school planning committee for the proposed early elementary school project, Ms. Martin has worked tirelessly to guide the committee through the complex procedures required by the Massachusetts School Building Authority, meeting with state officials, working closely with the project manager and design firm, and keeping other members of the committee and the public fully informed each step of the way. Ms. Martin has continually provided strong support for programs to address the academic, co-curricular, social, and emotional needs of students in the Eastern Public Schools. An individual of remarkable intelligence and creativity she possesses an in-depth understanding of educational trends, budget development, and policy formulation. Jane Martin has earned the respect and admiration not only of her colleagues on the school committee and district administrators, faculty, and staff, but also of parents, town officials, and countless others in the community. So a couple of additional comments about Jane. Jane is a person who really works very quietly but diligently behind the scenes. She never grabs the spotlight. She's always modest about her contributions. She just waves off any attention to any attempt to bring attention to her really very significant work on behalf of the schools. Most people have no idea how much Jane does. It, I mean, I would say that it's been practically a full-time job past year between school planning and school committee. Um, for the school committee, she's become effectively our in-house professional development chair. <laughs> She scours the educational landscape for information about new initiatives in other districts, not only within the state, but across the country and worldwide. Admittedly, many of the highly effective practices she identifies are out of reach for our budgetarily challenged district, so it's a bit of a tease sometimes when she <laughs> brings these wonderful ideas to us, but the information she provides sparks new ideas and speaking for myself, helps keep the focus on the importance of remaining open to constructive change and to striving for continuous improvement. So Jane, I'm just going to miss you very, very much. And you, I, I mean, I know that you're going to I'm not going involved, in, right. <laughs> right. Kind of, you know, eases the pain a bit. Right. But um, thank you so much, uh, Representative Cronin and Senator Timothy for, thank you. for thank you coming much. tonight, because I think it was really important that people be aware of how much mean Jane means to all of us and how much she has contributed to our district. Thank you. So. Okay, time for a meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I, 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 again, I'm, I'm really overwhelmed. I didn't expect this. Um, I, I'm, I'm sad to be leaving the committee, but I also feel like sometimes new voices and new perspectives are really, really critically important. I'm confident that um, the new member on the school committee, because this is an uncontested election, so I think the results are pretty, pretty well known, um, is going to be um, a really strong contributor. And I'm looking forward to, to watching what happens. So, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Okay. Thank you. Can we clap for Jane? No. Yes. <laughs> Okay, on to some more mundane subjects. <laughs> minutes. Okay, first set of minutes are from Thursday, March 28th, 2019. Does anyone have any comments or questions? <coughs> Excuse me. No? All right. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes of Thursday, March 28th, 2019. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Thank you. The next set of minutes are the executive session minutes from Thursday, March 7th, 2019. Can't discuss them in public since they are executive session, but does anyone want them held to discuss later in executive session? No? Nope. All right, so I'll make a motion to approve but not release the minutes of Thursday, March 7th, 2019. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Thank you. Okay, I already signed payments. So the next item on the agenda is discussion and possible vote on turf replacement recommendation. Mrs. Pruitt? Tonight we have 
our Director of Operations, David Twombly here, along with our Athletic Director, Bill Matthews, and representatives from Activitas, Jonathan Chartwick and Patrick McGuire, to present um, some of our questions that we had at our last meeting. Yeah, so uh, basically uh, what we, this is kind of an extension of our last meeting from last week. Mm -hmm. So there were several different questions that came up from last meeting, uh, working with Bill and mostly with John from Activitas. Compiled all those questions and we made a PowerPoint uh, presentation, which John will go over. In addition, Bill and I will kind of chime in where it is. I just I want to start off by clearing up a little bit of um, some questions before from last week, uh, just about who we are. Um, there was maybe some confusion as to whether or not we work directly for a turf company or do that, we don't. We're landscape architects and civil engineers. Our specialization is outdoor sports. So you can see from the slide here, we do everything from master planning, natural grass fields, running tracks, tennis courts, traditional landscape architecture and residential design and civil engineering. So we're, we're not people who do synthetic turf fields only. We don't work with the synthetic turf uh, companies. We don't take money from them. We don't do anything. We represent only our clients. Our clients are municipalities like Easton, public schools throughout the Commonwealth. We also work for colleges and universities throughout the Commonwealth and across the country like Harvard and MIT and Boston College and also professional sports franchises like the Patriots and the Revolution. So hope that clears up any confusion that people in the community might have that we're here selling the synthetic turf. That's not the case. We're here to represent what makes the most sense for you as a community when you're trying to renovate this facility. Okay. You did that. Um, so following our meeting last week, uh, we were tasked with a number of questions as it relates to alternative infill, specifically organics. Um, and then since that meeting, we were also asked to provide some additional information on the design process. So first, we'll start with the design process, kind of where we started and how we got to tonight's meeting. Um, and then we'll uh, try to address each of the individual questions as it relates to organic infills, uh, question by question. Um, so the first two questions we do want to uh, discuss, um, there's a question of who is on the turf subcommittee and how, why, and when was Activitas chosen. So I want to let uh, Bill Matthews speak to those two questions. first thing I did is I reached out to a number of various schools because we've got turf fields all around us and uh, a number of them have been put in recently. I reached out to them and asked uh, for some references. Please tell us some people that you've worked with that you know um, and tell us what you thought of the work that they did. And we ended up with three names. Um, we brought all three of those companies in, including Activitas for an interview. It was Dave Field at the DBW, David, David Twombly and myself that interviewed these, um, these firms and the representatives from the firms. We were extremely impressed with Activitas for their professionalism and their integrity. Um, 
and their extensive uh, experience and knowledge in, in uh, managing term projects. And they knew the industry and had what we felt was a much deeper knowledge than uh, the other firms that were out there that had been recommended. So we felt very confident that these guys can help guide us professionally through this project and have the knowledge to do it uh, with integrity and to do it correctly. So any, other, any questions that you might have for me relative to this process? Um, okay. Why don't we we'll hold the questions till the end? Okay. okay. All right. So I'll piggyback on um, what Dave, uh, I'm sorry, uh, what Bill has mentioned. So um, late December 2017, we had an interview with the subcommittee, and then at the beginning of 2018, we had an interview with the school committee, and uh, we were selected to work on this project with you folks. Um, at the end of February, we had our kickoff meeting with the subcommittee, and then there was also a few coaches and other people from the high school that attended the meeting to try and give some feedback. Um, the first thing we did was went through a programming uh, meeting, um, so really getting an understanding from uh, the subcommittee on the existing turf field and the existing track facility. What works about it, what doesn't work about it. Um, you know, what games are played on there, how's it used in the summer, does the band use the facility getting as much information as we could from the users on how the facility runs, and then what are the deficiencies, what are things we could add. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about last week was ball netting. It was a, a concern at the end lines, so we discussed the, the fact that there's a temporary system. We want to get something that's a little more permanent, so how, how we incorporate that into the project. Um, and then prior to that meeting, we had also um, engaged Sports Labs USA, our third party testing agency, um, to do performance testing on the field. So a few things they did, they checked the field, so we wanted to make sure the turf field and the base stone underneath were draining appropriately, because uh, obviously if there was drainage issues, that's something we would want to address as part of this project. Um, they also looked at the infill that was in the existing field. Again, does it drain appropriately? What's the um, particle size of the infill, and then what is the adequacy of that infill to be reused in a, a new system if that was the direction the subcommittee in the town eventually wanted to go through. And fortunately, all the test results came back good, that the field drains terrifically and the infill is appropriate for a new system if that was the route we would go. So um, during that kickoff meeting, the other thing we reviewed was a turf education process. So what that is was Pat and myself coming and explaining what's in the market right now, the, the different turf products going over the different fibers, the backing, all of the different um, alternative infills that are available, so crumb rubber, uh, organics, uh, TP, EPDM, all, all the different infills we talked about the uh, last week. Uh, talked about resilient underlings, pads that can be installed underneath the turf fields um, that add additional uh, safety and protection to your athletes. I'll discuss that a little bit further uh, down the presentation. Um, and then talked a little bit about the project itself, how you remove the carpet, how you remove the infill, what you do to prepare the base for a new synthetic turf system. So all that was in the initial programming and, and kickoff meeting. Um, during that meeting, we did talk extensively about infills, um, you know, talked about the results of the infill you have in your field now, along with what are the other infills, what are the pros and cons to each of those, because they all have different pros and cons, whether it be premiums and costs, uh, maintenance, or, or other issues that we've seen on other fields that have been installed. Um, so that was really the first uh, initial conversation we had about the infills that um, educated the subcommittee as we move forward through the project. So following that kickoff meeting, uh, we had started schematic design, where we compiled all the information that we were presented by uh, the town and, and uh, the users at that meeting, and started developing a uh, schematic design um, to understand what the scope of work was going to be. And generally, it's been the same throughout the project, resurfacing the turf, uh, resurfacing the existing track, and then the balling at the end lines. And at that point, we also started preparing cost estimates to understand what the different costs would be um, for all the components, and we also looked at um, the alternative infills, what those premium costs were, um, in, in addition to the inclusion of a resilient underlayment pad underneath that synthetic turf system. Um, at that point, we started digesting the costs. I think Bill went back, started looking budget-wise to see um, how we could make the funding work, because it was different funding sources that would have to be used in order to uh, facilitate this project. Um, so we presented the schematic design at the end of March of 2018. Um, at that point, about a month later, we had had four turf vendors come in to give their own presentations. Uh, the companies presented were Shaw Sports, Sprint Turf, 
field turf and astroturf. Uh, those are four of about you know, six or seven uh, companies in this area that generally can uh, meet the performance specifications that we develop. Um, as Pat mentioned, uh, you know, during, when we're preparing specifications for our clients, it's a performance-based specification, which basically says you need to provide a turf system that equals all of these components, whether it be qual qualification-based, so we have to make sure we have enough experience uh, for that installer to put them in, so we don't have a turf company that just started up last week and is buying carpet down the street and, and thinks they can put the carpet in. Uh, we want to make sure that reputable companies have done this over a period of time. Um, and we also brought in companies uh, that have used all types of infills. So again, you know, getting their information on their systems, uh, their experience with infills, and, and any information they can provide to the subcommittee. Uh, one of the important questions we asked was, for a field that has football, soccer, lacrosse, field hockey, and much more use, what are the appropriate systems to look at? Um, and generally what they, did, what they recommended um, was a dual fiber system um, with or without a pad, and uh, you could certainly use sand and rubber as being um, the most cost-effective solution based on the available use of the existing infill that's there. Um, so piggybacking on the recommendations that they had, we started to formulate what we think the proposed infector system should be. Following that, on June 5th, uh, myself, uh, Billy Casey and Bill Matthews had made trips to about four or five different uh, facilities around this area. Uh, to walk in those fields, uh, get a sense on how they feel, how they look, and just what they look like in the ground rather than looking at um, just the fields and pictures of paper. Um, they all had different lengths of installation. A few had just been installed the last few years. We also walked uh, Wheaton College, which has been in the ground for about five or six years. So to also see how the fields wear and tear over time, because you know, as you know, anything you buy at first looks great, but you know, down the line through the warranty is it going to hold up. So we were able to get a sense on how these fields look from day one on through the warranty. Um, so based on the information from the kickoff meeting, the schematic design, the turf vendor uh, presentations, and the visits, uh, the subcommittee had given us direction to proceed um, with the following scope of work. Uh, dual fiber system um, with sand and rubber infill that we would use the existing infill and supplement as necessary. Um, it would be installed over a resilient underlayment pad uh, that goes between the, the stone drainage base and the carpet on top. Um, and then resurfacing of the track and then ball nang is an alternate to the bid. From that direction, uh, in June, June 5th, uh, through the last several months, we've started to develop the drawings to be prepared for uh, putting them out for uh, bidding. And we've also been assisting uh, Bill with the CPC application, some information he needs for funding. Um, and, and any other information that he needs to get out to questions from uh, the community. Uh, September 28th was a meeting that we attended for the school committee, which we updated uh, the school committee on the project. Uh, talked a little bit about infills at that point as well. Um, and then also Bill had shared kind of some of the funding sources and how we we're going to get this project uh, to move forward. At the time, school committee said uh, we we're uh, in a good place to proceed to start developing a little further, going, getting the CPC applications, um, starting to look at schedules to hopefully bid it out sometime this spring. Um, as I know, the CPC meeting was February 7th, uh, which I attended with Bill Matthews and answered a few questions that um, the group uh, had, and I, I believe funding is in place from CPC to be provided um, at town meeting. And then since then, uh, again, we have been developing the drawings a little further so that we hopefully can go out to bid soon. Um, met with the school committee last week, and then we're here tonight to answer any further questions related to design and working at the infills. Um, I want to touch on some of the rationale for the choices made by the subcommittee for the synthetic turf systems. Um, so, so, one of the things off the bat was the turf system. How did we get to this dual fiber system? So to just explain slightly what that means, on the far right there's two pictures of synthetic turf fibers. The top one is a monofilament, the, the bottom one is a slip film. The, the difference in those two, the monofilament is a spined fiber uh, so it's one single strand, and then the slit film on the bottom is cut into individual strands. One, one piece of fiber is sliced into multiple strands. When you pull them out, it kind of looks like an onion bag. Um, each of them have a little different characteristics for athletics. Um, the monofilament tends to stand up more, so if you have a field for soccer or uh, multi-purpose field that you're going to play field hockey on, that's an ideal fiber because it's going to slow the ball down. Um, the slit film fiber tends to lay over a little more, which gives the ball a little more of a 
a little, little more speed to the ball, so the monofilm is beneficial to, to control that. Uh, but the slip film does a much better job locking in the sand and rubber so we don't have fly out of the infill when the players are running or sliding. Um, so what the turf uh, companies have done is taken the two of those fibers, combined them into one to give better ball um, resistance for certain sports, keep the infill locked in, um, and it's more aesthetically pleasing as you have some strands that are um, straining the ground, and over time those slip film fibers will lay over. So. Um, based on our conversations with uh, the turf vendors, they thought for a multi-purpose facility that was an ideal um, system for, for the fibers and so. Um, the resilient underlayment was then the next uh, decision point that was made by the subcommittee. Um, you know, we talked a lot about science behind uh, potential concerns with uh, rubber. Um, there's a lot of science to athletes and concussions, uh, and the resilient underlayment is something that certainly. Uh, reacts to those um, items. Um, there are statistics that one of five concussions caused for athletics is the impact that a player makes when they hit the surface, not necessarily the initial impact. So what happens is, if you're in a soccer game, two athletes are running for the ball together, they hit each other's heads, they don't have the control after that initial hit to brace themselves for the ground. So what happens is that resilient underlayment that's underneath that turf surface gives more uh, impact attenuation and safety for when that player falls to the ground. Um, there's particular tests that are done to check what the performance standards are for um, synthetic turf fields in, in relation to natural grass, because those are the standards we're trying to meet. Um, HIT is one of them. It's a human, um, I'm sorry, head injury criteria, which essentially it's a um, anvil that is uh, raised above the ground and dropped from certain height and with a numerical factor, it's figuring out what the critical fall height is um, if that one step um, anvil hits the ground. So essentially try and mimic a four foot, five foot, six foot tall individual athlete when they are impacted, fall to the ground, is that gonna protect them from concussions? Um, GMAX is another thing that's been used by the turf industry for years in, in a way of um, checking this impact. Um, that's going from about two feet above grade, and it's a flat headed missile. So when it hits, it's really um, testing the resiliency for when your body hits the ground. Um, the anvil for the HIC test is more, it is a rounded anvil, so it's mimicking the actual head, and it's usually coming again for about 1.4 to 1.5 meters above grade. So it's mimicking, you know, if I were to fall, hit, hit myself on the ground, versus, you know, when you're dropping a bullet from two feet, you're really not mimicking the impact your head can make for the surface. Um, so that has an additional cost and premium to the synthetic turf system we're talking about. And this subcommittee was, felt very strongly that the resilient underlayment should be part of this, the scope of work. And that was, you know, one, once the, the results of the crumb rubber uh, showed that we could reuse and there's, there's science to back up that there aren't any elevated concerns, you know, the, the, the premium for that pad was something they felt strongly should be part of this project. Touch on that a little bit. Um, the next, the, the next thing obviously was maintenance. Um, you know, probably about 10, 15 years ago when these turf fields started going in the ground, they, the turf vendor would say, you know, put the field in, eight years from now, come talk to us if no maintenance required. And that's just not the case. Any synthetic turf field does require maintenance. Um, each of them have a little more maintenance, more, a little less depending on uh, what the system is. Um, specifically related to infills. Um, so one of the things we're tasked with was we, know, we need a safe surface that also needs to have minimal maintenance because the, there's only so many maintenance hours and um, money available for all the uh, fields and, and um, land in, in town. So therefore, you know, we need to maintain this appropriately, but we need to be as cost effective with our maintenance as possible. Um, we touched on slightly the track it is in need of a resurfacing, so we also had to make sure we had costs in there for that resurfacing. Um, with the track itself, it gets to a point that if it's not resurfaced every eight to 10 years or so, there's a potential that one day it falls off and, and you're replacing the entire surface. We're right at that point where we think we can resurface, uh, which is a lot more cost-effective effort than if we had to replace the whole system. So that was clearly something that needed to be uh, included in the scope of work. Um, so based on all of those factors, um, along with cost, because ultimately, you know, the factors of safety, performance, uh, maintenance, everything rolled in, and then looking at the most cost-effective solution, uh, knowing that um, there's a budget for every project, and we need to make sure that this project fits into a reasonable budget that the town can afford.
thing, one of the last questions related to the design process is what happens if the synthetic turf field doesn't happen this summer? Um, you know, where, where we stand with the field as it is right now and what's the future? Um, it's hard to tell the future. However, um, as we talked about last week, the field has reached its useful life. Um, if a resourcing doesn't happen this summer, we would suspect that um, some aggressive maintenance would be required, uh, potentially um, adding additional infill, which could be a challenge because over time those fibers degrade, um, so they're much shorter than they were when it was initially installed. So the, the lack of fiber doesn't allow the infill to be locked in place as well as it should have been from day one. So that, that becomes a challenge where we want more infill, yet it's gonna be hard to keep that locked in place. Um, and then I, I think from um, the school side, you know, we, they would look at uh, doing some testing, you know, seeing how it is performing, you know, potentially the GMAC and the HIC that I spoke about a little bit, um, seeing what those results are and, and de determining if it's still a safe surface, if we have to wait, um, if it's not a safe surface, looking to see what other available uh, playing space either on campus or elsewhere is available, whether that be other town facilities, other towns, um, Stonehill, or what have you. Uh, Bill, do you want to touch on that any further? I think you got it. Okay. So that, that sums up generally the design process uh, to date. Uh, the, the next portion of this presentation is to uh, directly answer all the questions we had as it relates to organic infills. Um, so just uh, for anyone that wasn't here last week or, or a reminder from what we talked about last week, um, on the top right, those are the two different fibers we're looking at. Um, on the, the far left, uh, this is the turf system profile. So you have the synthetic turf fibers, you have the carpet backing that the fibers are attached to, the infill in the middle, um, and then the resilient underlayment pad below that. And I've already touched a little bit on uh, some of the testing. Obviously the testing I, I spoke about, we're, we're trying to mimic natural grass uh, characteristics when we're looking at the synthetic turf fields. Um, so with the pad, we, we generally look not necessarily at the initial install, but about five years down the road. How are these fields going to perform? Um, there's three comparisons we have here, and I'm sorry, the, the print's a little small, but you know, what, what's a natural grass field uh, going to perform at? What's a synthetic turf field going to perform at without a pad five years after installation? What's a synthetic turf field with a pad, how that's going to install in five years? Generally, what we have found through testing is a synthetic turf field with a pad will perform like natural grass field would and have good resiliency. Um, the numbers for a synthetic turf field without a pad, the, 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 the field is firmer, harder, and potentially not as safe on down the road. Um, now, that being said, there is nothing unsafe with a synthetic turf field without a pad. It's just an extra precaution. As we've gone through the science over um, concussions, it, it's a real good benefit to include in your project. I'm actually going to skip to this. These are all the questions separately, but we reiterate them in the next one, so let's move on to the presentation a little bit. So the first question was costs. What are the capital costs of the product, uh, of the organic infills in addition to the sand and rubber? Um, so we talked a little bit about products last week. There's, there's generally two products that we would specify for um, this project. One is green play, and one is geofill. Um, the green play, uh, Green play organic infill can be installed by most of the turf vendors. A geofill is a proprietary to a certain turf vendor, Shaw Sports. So if they did an organic, they would use that product. The other ones uh, would generally use the green play. Um, both of them are a combination of cork and coconut husk. Uh, I know the geofill is about 90% coconut to 10% cork. Um, and then the, the percentages are a little different for green play, but, but fairly similar. And they're fairly similar products. Um, Costs. Uh, so as part of the premium, we're not looking at just what the additional cost is for the organic. So some other things we would have to consider. The first thing is, if we were not to reuse the existing infill in the field, we need to do something with it. We need to remove it and either dispose of it or recycle it elsewhere. Um, so those costs are about $25,000 in addition uh, to the, the initial uh, project. Uh, with the organic infills, we talked a little bit about the need for irrigation. Uh, so these organic infills need to hold a certain moisture content that about 30% um, is the content we're looking for. And we know, especially in this area of the world, you know, we're going to get droughts during the, winter, or during, during the summer. 
Um, so to assure that we keep that moisture content in there, uh, irrigation is something that most of the vendors will recommend. Um, based on providing a connection of water to the trap from the snack shack, um, water into the field, a quick coupler uh, to make that connection, some pavement repairs, and also a traveler irrigation system that you would have to purchase. That's about a $30,000 effort there. Um, and then the premiums for the two different infills are slightly different. A um, dollar six cents per square foot for green play and about $1.24 uh, square foot for the geofill. So when you add all those costs in, um, the, the green play, which is a less expensive uh, organic, is around $137,000 and the geofill would be around $151,000. So um, if we were to look at an organic infill, your premium is around one hundred thirty-seven to one hundred fifty-one thousand. For the maintenance requirements, uh, that, that's a key component as it relates to organics. Organics do have much more maintenance involved than uh, sand and rubber. Uh, sand and rubber, you're going to groom the field maybe every uh, four to six weeks or so. You want to fluff up the infill, make sure it's not over compacted, um, then pick up any bobby pins, hair elastics, things like that that get embedded into the infill. With the organic infills, uh, there is a little more maintenance involved. Uh, one of the first things off the bat is uh, about every two to three years, you need a top dress with new infill. Um, because this is a natural organic material, it does break down over time, so you will lose potentially about a quarter inch um, of height to this infill, so you'll be bringing in about a quarter of an inch every two to three years. And over the lifespan of the eight-year warranty, we figure that's about three times you're going to top dress that. Um, in addition to that, you're going to want to decompact prior to top dressing so that it's not over compacting, you're putting a softer lift on top. That dollar amount, depending on what the infill is, ranges from about um, thirty to sixty thousand dollars over the life of the warranty, or about ten to twenty thousand dollars per occurrence for top dressing. Um, as it relates to decompaction, they also require decompaction every year. So you're going to decompact when you do the top dressing award annually. You're going to decompact. So that's either a five thousand dollar effort, which is generally about forty thousand dollars over the eight year period or probably about 12 to 16 hours of your own maintenance if you have the equipment. It's not something that you would necessarily have to source out, but it's man hours you'd have to find uh, per year for that maintenance. And as we've talked about uh, a little bit with the organic, well, I'm sorry, with the irrigation is um, depending on uh, the time of year, what, what the weather conditions are, there's the potential of irrigating the field once or twice a year. Or, I'm sorry, one, once or twice a week. Uh, so that, it's an automatic uh, system that you uh, plug in, and, and generally a traveler system you set up on one side of the field. There's a reel that will bring the irrigation to the other end of the field. It takes quite a bit of time, but it's, it's a system that someone can set up, go do something else, and they can leave it in place while it's happening, but there's setup and breakdown, so there's certainly maintenance required, um, man manpower to get the system working, and then to store it, bring it to the site, depending on where it is. Not necessarily a main, well, it, I, I, I would consider this a maintenance issue. Uh, one, one of the other things, along with the organic infills, with the moisture that's in there, um, the end of your fall season, the beginning of your spring season, because the moisture is in this organic, it does, it will have the ability to freeze. So you may be in a situation where we get a cold November, we do have a frozen field, and either you get rain on top that could create some drainage issues, or you have the football team that's going to be having their last game on Thanksgiving, and now you have a frozen field. And then you have to look at either ways to relocate or um, somehow try to thaw that field out if you're not waiting for the sun to do that. So um, that is a concern that we've run into on some of the fields we have done. Um, and then obviously in the spring seasons when lacrosse and other teams want to get out there, we want to make sure that that organic does have time to get um, sun to impact it and uh, thaw before you let your players play. Because if you did some of that HIC or GMAX testing on the field during those times of year with this organic, you will see elevated rates that may warrant you not having anyone use the field. So as it relates to maintenance uh, costs over the eight-year period, uh, with all the top dress and the other maintenance required, the range is around seventy dollars to $100,000 of maintenance over that eight years. So we, we look at the initial cost of around one hundred thirty seven dollars to $151,000, but we also have to look there's annually and, and over the life of the warranty, additional costs that need to be captured and, and found somewhere in the budget. Uh, question number three that was asked, does the organic infill break down? I know it, um, it does, and, and top dressing is required every two to three years. Um, 
where are these organic infills sourced? So green clay is sourced from India, and geophyll has sources from India and Sri Lanka. Um, what are the irrigation requirements for the organic infills? So we've touched on this lightly, but um, let me read specifically some of the language that I pulled together. The water requirements for the organic infill are directly related to the amount of, fre amount of frequency of rainfall and relative humidity. The moisture content for both organic infill shall be maintained between 30 and 40 percent. If the organic infill drops below these levels, uh, three to six thousand gallons of water shall be applied to the organic infill. So, um, you know, one of the things we want to make sure that when we get to that rate, we want to make sure it's getting fully irrigated. Um, and if it gets to a point that it needs that irrigation, it's, it's, it's going to be quite an effort. And, and, and like anything, we don't want to just irrigate it all at once and try to get all that moisture in. We would want to make sure we're maintaining it properly over time. Uh, during periods of drought or dry weather, the field may require additional irrigation over uh, a few times a week. Um, if proper moisture content is not maintained, the system can become dusty. Uh, more uh, splash and infill fly out, so a little bit of what I talked about where the infill flies out from the fibers and doesn't lock in place and um, it's not as safe a product when it does do that fly out. Um, and the infill is more susceptible to break down as well during those dry periods. Um, moisture content should be measured using a, a meter. Uh, so that's something during dry events or even during weekly maintenance, you may want to have someone come out there and do a number of spots again to get a sense of where that moisture level is so you know if it's getting to the point that we need to irrigate or that we're in good shape based on um, weather conditions we're having. Um, and again, you know, just, just typical monitoring of that field. Um, is there any available testing of the organic infill? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, geofill has been tested. Um, Green play may have been tested, but the, the results I received were from geofilm. Um, results provided conclude that hazardous metals, as well as volatile and semi-volatile organic chemicals that are present in or extracted from geofilm were found not to be present or at levels below maximum regulatory limits. Uh, we were asked what companies we have worked with. Um, so for the organic infills, we've done a few fields with uh, Geofill, which is um, a vendor for Shaw Sports, and then Infill Pro Geo Plus. Uh, they're, they're a vendor we haven't used in quite some time, uh, but we've used in the past. Uh, we have not used Greenplay or Brockfill, um, two companies that we, uh, the Greenplay that we're talking about tonight and Brockfill we mentioned uh, last week. Brockfill is just gotten on the market. They don't have a field in the ground right now. Um, so we would be very hesitant to have you as our client be the first guinea pig to use that infill and see how it works because uh, there's just no history. And I, and I think that's one of the things we look at, the qualifications for the whole turf system is making sure these things have been in the ground, have been uh, used, and, and there's a good history because we don't want to be in a situation where we use something for the first time, it fails, and then it, it, it's not a good situation for anyone. Uh, what public or private school districts has active to us worked with to install organic infills? Uh, there's a few in the Commonwealth. Uh, Simmons College, there's two athletic fields um, at Daly Field in Boston that we installed organic infills a few years ago. Um, that same summer, Groton School uh, in Groton, Mass. has a field that's uh, organic. Uh, the Shady Hill School, uh, a field in Cambridge we put down a number of years ago, about 10. And then Rollins College down in uh, Winter Park, Florida uh, was installed a few years ago. Um, as it relates to all of those facilities, they're all privately maintained. Um, Simmons College is a DCR property, but they have a 25-year lease um, and do all the maintenance out there. So all the facilities we worked on with organic infills are privately maintained and in private facilities. Um, is there any feedback from any other school districts related to the organics? Um, I know Bill, you had spoken to the athletic director in Andover, um, and if you want to share some of his comments. Um, I had a discussion with Bill Martin, who's a former athletic director of Sheridan High School, who's up in Andover now. He's been up there a couple of years, so they have one of these skills up there. It was installed before he became the athletic director. It's a nice surface to play on. Um, we did it today when they get down towards the cork and coconut flows away, so you're raking off the side of the field. Um, and other than that, really not a lot of not a lot of feedback. It certainly is a nice field. Um, it's just a matter of what you know what the right field is for your particular situation. 
Um, and then the last question was the process used for selecting chrome rubber. I think I uh, touched on this um, already. Um, but, but again, you know, first and foremost, I think um, safety and, and, and the, the potential uh, health concerns were looked at from day one. Um, and, and once it was decided that the, the chrome rubber from science uh, looked to have no elevated risks of um, health concerns and it was adequate to be reused, um, we then went to the next step to look at the other components that we could include in the project. And like I said, I've spoken a lot about the resilient pad this evening. Um, I think that's an important um, element that's been added to this project. Because again, you know, that there's, there's plenty of science that talks about concussions and, and the safety of these athletic fields, and that will certainly help uh, with some of those concerns for your athletes. Last piece of this presentation is the cost estimate. So this is very similar to what we shared last week. Um, so the subtotal for the mobilization site preparation, the drainage testing, uh, the synthetic turf system, track resurfacing, and ball netting is around $752,000. That's with um, bonds, overhead profit, and general conditions for contractors. Of that $752,000, uh, $73,000 is allocated to the resilient pad that I've spoken about. Uh, we also have right now just under $60,000 in contingency, which we're hoping um, will be uh, ho hoping by the time we get the design completely finished that there's not many unknowns on this project. It is uh, not going to look pretty straightforward as a scope is related. Um, you know, the, the only thing we could find is when we remove the carpet. You know, if, we, if we're seeing something with the stone base that we just can't see when we're on the field right now, um, or, or a certain pocket that doesn't drain like the other drainage testing came in. Uh, but we're, we're hopeful we won't necessarily need to use uh, much of any of that uh, contingency. So the uh, opinion of probable project costs for the whole project is $812,317. Um, if we were to look at green play and geofill as uh, additional items, that would bring the totals from $812,000 to $949,000 and $963,000, respectively. Thank you. Sure. So I think we'll let school committee members ask some questions and then we'll open it up to the public. Okay, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, all right, so um, I have some questions, but I'll see if other committee members will have questions that they want to ask. Why don't you start? Because I'm still looking for my. Okay. Um, so we've talked about the studies with crumb rubber and people have expressed concerns about that. Do you know of any concerns with either the cork matter or the coconut core or the silica sand that's used in the organic? Have you heard any concerns about that? Or are there any long-term studies on the matters? No long-term studies okay. on that. It's still a relatively new product. Sure. Four or five years of more significant commercial use here in the United okay. States. It originated in Italy, so if we all went to Italy, we could find fields that are a little bit older. Yeah. Uh, but there's not a lot of long-term study. Okay. And so, go ahead. can I just follow up? So, just because there are no long-term studies, though, doesn't automatically assume um, that when there are long-term studies that they won't find anything. I guess you know, there's a lot of information right now that's available on the crumb rubber, a lot. Um, and there's very, when, I know we've all looked, mm -hmm. I, I couldn't find those kinds of comparable studies on the PBI. And so I just wondered, <clears throat> is it because they just haven't had time to do them? Because no one's asked to have them done? Um, Probably no one's asked okay. to have them done. Okay. Okay. They're, they're not certified organic, though. They're just considered organic yeah, just because of the materials. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah. I, th I think that's actually a pretty meaningless term because I've actually read several articles that said there's no certification by either the USDA or any third party 
that it's actually organic. So it's it's kind of so called organic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm made out of cardboard. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, Mr. Matthews, I have a couple questions for you. Um, so, as the athletic budget stands now, do you think you'd be able to cover the cost of maintenance for a turf field using the organic infill, assuming there will be no additional funds from the school operating budget? No. Okay. Um, and you discussed a little bit how to determine when the field is no longer safe to use. Do you have, I know it's an estimate, do you have a timetable on when that would be? We would do that um, probably in June to try to determine uh, what, what the status of the field was. It doesn't, it doesn't become unplayable overnight. Okay. Um, but we would have to evaluate and see how close we are at that point in time. And it's impossible to determine exactly. Typically, I think there are parts of the field that become harder than other parts of the field because okay. you get more mechanical wear on those areas. So we'd have to determine the safety of the field, whether or not we could do any kind of remedy to try to fix it up and keep it going for possibly another year. But okay. it's just, I don't have the kind of insight, and I'm not really sure anybody does to know for sure exactly where that stands. I know that based on industry standards and the expected life of the field, I think our field has stood up really well. Mm -hmm. I think our DPW has done a phenomenal job <coughs> of, of maintaining that turf field. Um, you know, it's just, we just know it's it's coming to the end, but I can't tell you exactly where sure. it is. So, we, you know, the, the plan was if we can get things in place, this certainly would seem to be the optimal. I, mean, I think one of the things that is somewhat overlooked is the track situation. Yeah, I was and when ask I was you on the that. track yesterday, I was looking at it and I said to myself, we're really getting close here. Sure. And it's not a safety issue. It's an issue of the adherence of the latex that the, the renewal process is to put more latex on top of the existing mm -hmm. track. And that cost is about $135,000. If we don't do it in time, then the latex will not adhere to the okay. existing surface, and then the whole thing has to be torn up and replaced at an estimated cost of about three times the $135,000. Okay. I know you've probably answered this <clears throat> 10 times already, I just don't remember. When we resurface the track, what will that get us for expected life of the track? Will it be comparable to what we're going to see in terms of now a new life on the turf? Is it another 10 years we'll get? Yeah, maybe make it a little more understandable. So there's lifts of rubber and, and uh, latex that go on the bottom to build mm -hmm. up. And then when you reach the top, that the red surface they put on it, that has UV inhibitors in it. The bottom layers have no UV inhibitors in it. So if you have that red wear out, what gets underneath deteriorates. Yeah. So, which okay. is why John had said it falls off a cliff. It's fine, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. All of a sudden there's no UV inhibitors the whole thing breaks down sure. and falls apart. So okay. by putting the new red stuff on top of it, you push out the, the life of that field quite okay. a bit. Oh, the life of that track is you. Um, and so, Mr. Matthews, say we didn't do anything with the field. Once it was deemed to be unsafe, it would just be closed, correct? Sure. And so at that point, what would happen to um, the games and practices that would normally be on that field? We would try to accommodate practices on our own facility, although we're overcrowded in the fall as it is. I don't have enough space for the existing teams that, mm -hmm. that do practice on our facilities, including Parkview. Um, we would just have to look at um, you know, whether or not Keach Fields would be an alternative, bus mm -hmm. kids over there, there would be an additional expense for that. And then when it comes to events, we would just have to go sport by sport to see which events we might be able to host on grass fields and which events we would have to move. Like, we don't have a football field, so we would have to go somewhere else for football. Okay. Um, some of the other sports we may be able to play on grass. Certainly okay. sports like field hockey, it's a completely different sport. So when you have a competitive varsity team trying to compete on grass that is used to playing on turf, it, it's a completely different game. So that's, that's a difficult challenge. Not impossible, but certainly changes the game significantly. Um, and if we did have to go to other towns, uh, would there be, do towns charge you to come and use their field for either practices or games that you're not scheduled to be at? Typically, no, because if someone asks us to use ours, we're not going to charge them. Okay. It's just one of those relationship things where sure. you know, we're, we're going to return a favor, hoping that someday when we need it, they'll return that favor. Um, 
So I don't think that there would be a charge for it. The bigger challenge would be availability because most of them, most of them are both solid on okay. their fields like we are. What about busing to the to the practices? Right, so Those we would have to, you know, if, we, if busing, we were using off-site facilities, okay. we would have to get buses for it, so it would be an expense involved with that. Okay. Um, so as we all have, I've read a bunch of the studies. Um, I did call some schools that have used the organic infill. Um, some of them didn't get back to me. Um, one of them that did is the Groton School, which is a private school in Groton. I talked to the director of building and grounds. Um, he's happy with the field. He said they went from a grass field to turf with the organic infill, so he couldn't give me any comparative maintenance costs. Um, he said that he did buy extra infill when the field was installed two to three years ago and that they've just about gone through that extra infill, so they're going to have to purchase some more. He said in the cold temperature, the water tends to pool and freeze, which I think you've talked about. Um, and then he said during heavy rain, the infill will float to the surface and it needs to be redistributed. So he said they had to buy a special piece of equipment to do that, and then he hired the company that installed it to do that work. Um, I also spoke with the COO of the Fesedin School, which is a private school in Newton. Again, they went from a grass field to a turf with organic infill. Um, he said freezing isn't an issue for them because they don't use their field in cold temperatures. Um, he said they do have to keep it at the right moisture level or it breaks down. He said a couple of years ago when it was particularly dry, they had to pay $80,000 to top off the field. So what they did is they bought a self-walking water cannon to use now. Um, but he said if he had to do it again, he would definitely put in an irrigation system. <coughs> Excuse me. He says it needs to be groomed every two weeks and twice a year they hire a company to come in to do a deep grooming. And although he also got some extra infill when the field was put in, he hasn't gone through it yet. But um, he says he expects he will need to top off uh, a few bags each year. The only public school I was able to get in touch with is Winthrop High School. Talked to the athletic director there. Again, they started with a grass field and then went to a turf with organic infill. Um, so he couldn't give me any maintenance comparison either. He said, again, that he was given some extra infill when the field was installed. They've had the field about a year and a half and they haven't quite gone through it yet. He said they hired somebody part-time to maintain the field. So um, I just I just thought those were mm -hmm. additional pieces of information. Mm -hmm. That would be Thanks interesting. Thanks for calling. Um, so, I mean, I have more to say, but if anyone has any more questions, I'd like to give you all opportunity. So. I'll, I'll say a couple things. Um, first of all, I, I read an article that was just published March 30th um, this year from the Loudoun County Public Schools. It was a full analysis in Virginia of um, it, it basically the title of the analysis was Problems with Alternative Infills. And it actually talked about several other kinds of alternative infills like the encapsulated rubber, the um, I think they were thermoplastic elastomer. Um, but they spent a lot of time talking about <laughs> a corkonut. The things we're learning. <laughs> oh, yes. yes. I did not ever think at this point in my life I would be um, obsessed with uh, crumb rubber. But anyway, uh, the, it, actually, I'll read a couple of quotes from this article. Corkonut turns to dust and it also blows away and floats readily during storm events, fouling waterways with suspended solids, TSS, I honestly don't even know what that is, and nutrients plus any binders, adhesives, biocides, and antifungals used on the field. And then it says um, so-called organic corkonut is not certified by USDA, we've talked about that before, and um, there's no third-party certification at all. And it's Basically, this article says it's completely unregulated, essentially. So you don't have any agency or, over, you know, kind of formal oversight. Um, it also said that, um, well, this was actually something I'm quite confused about. It talked about the silica sand that is used with the crumb rubber. But in this article, it seemed to be saying that it's also used with the so-called organic infill. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what this article said, but I was confused because you didn't mention the sand when you were talking about the so-called organic <coughs> infill. So, um, and you notice I am using the term so-called <laughs> because I am yeah. not certified. Um, 
that it seemed to indicate the actual percentage of silica sand with the um, plant-based infill was, was quite a bit higher than it is for the crumb rubber infill. And silica sand is actually, um, the American Ac Academy of Pediatrics, for example, says that it cannot be used for sandboxes because it is it, potentially quite dangerous for young children. So, and as I said, the silica sand percentage for coconut fields can actually be as high as 90%. Now the green play, it's 60%. But um, that's quite a bit higher than the 48% for crumb rubber. So I was actually as alarmed about the holes, and there's a lot about silica sand, most of which would make people quite uncomfortable. So I just feel like um, that for me was a very important piece of information because I had not been aware of this you know, kind of uh, the balance of the silica sand. And also because of the fact that the so-called organic fields can blow away more easily, you do have potential greater exposure anyway. So, so um, then there, there was quite a bit of discussion about um, fibers that could get into the lungs because there's this dust that comes from the coconut. So I, I mean, I feel like we'd really be taking a flyer, this is my opinion, obviously, if we went with the so-called organic, I didn't start out feeling that way. I think I've scanned about 40 articles now, and I would feel very uncomfortable with what is essentially an unproven, basically untested. I know they did some chemical tests on this in this one instance, but I'm not really talking about that. I'm talking about the longer-term usage. I mean, we don't really have, it doesn't seem to me, a lot of coconut infill um, turf fields where They've been around for 10 or 20 years, and you know that we have the kind of information we'd like to have in terms of the risks to to children. So I've read nothing that indicates that a crumb rubber infill is less safe or less toxic than organic. And I've kind of seen so-called organic, and I've kind of seen articles that indicated the potential for much for less safety and more toxicity in the um, plant-based. I don't know if that will turn out to be true. I mean, 20 years from now, we could be given a whole new set of data based on a longer-term assessment of this product. But I actually ended up being very concerned about something that I thought sounded like a great idea to start with. So, mm -hmm. so my only thing I'm going to try and be very brief is that, first of all, I appreciate the fact that you have stepped back and brought us all, kind of walked us through the process from the very beginning, because I think that a lot of the concern we had last week from the community perspective was because there was this sense that people didn't know how we got to where we got. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate you taking the, the time this evening to kind of walk us all through. Um, you know, like similar to, and I know Nancy, uh, it's similar to, I've read a lot. But I'm not a scientist. I am not. I'm not a scientist. So I have to be honest. When I'm when I'm skimming through articles, I'm kind of just picking what seems to be important facts. But what's really important to me is we had put a subcommittee together, which included expertise, and and you clearly have experience with a variety of different turfs. You clearly have used those different products in different locations, depending on what's needed. Um, your recommendation for our situation has been for the crumb rubber. Um, I feel like unless there was some really strong, compelling evidence, whether it be around safety, whether it be around the fact that there were some um, cost considerations that might make uh, PBI more appealing to us, um, that we would maybe step in and say, wait a minute, I don't get any of those things. I don't feel like your due diligence, I don't feel like the due diligence wasn't done. I feel like you've made a recommendation that at this point, I I'm very comfortable with. So that's where I am. Any other comments? All right, so um, before I go over how we make this decision, are there any questions or comments from the audience? Please state your name. Yes, Kyla Bennett. Um, I'm sorry I didn't make last week's meeting, I was traveling but I did watch it on mm -hmm. catch, and um, I am a PhD scientist. I do this for a living, and I frankly am a little bit stunned um, at misstatements that were made by the toxicologist last week, and um, you know, people willing to accept this risk. 
and specifically mm -hmm. um, the toxicologist who was here um, said there was, there was a huge body of evidence showing that foam rubber is safe. That's not true. Um, there is an absence of proof that crumb rub rubber causes right. cancer or these diseases. It is very, very difficult to prove that. It's not just with crumb rubber, mm -hmm. with anything. We look at Roundup, which the town of Easton, until now, was using. And just now they're saying, yeah, it does cause cancer. We've known it for years, but it's very difficult to prove. So I thought that was for her to phrase it like that, to say there's a huge body of evidence saying it's safe. That is not true. And I, and as a scientist, I want to share that with you. Sure. That is simply not true. The absence of a proof of harm is not the same thing as saying that something is safe. And there were a ton of other things she said that were wrong. That staph bacteria don't survive on crumb level. Absolutely not true. There's a 2018 article in a peer-reviewed medical journal, not something you can just Google, a peer-reviewed medical journal that said that the abrasion type um, of injuries that you get on artificial turf give you MRSA. It just came out recently. It's there. There's evidence there. Is she that said, for, and I'm sorry to interrupt you, is that for any kind of infill or specifically to crumb rubber? For the actual, for the artificial grass. For the artificial grass, okay. So she said it doesn't survive, it does survive on okay. rubber and grass. She said there were a few carcinogens, but at extremely low concentrations. Carcinogens can act at extremely low concentrations, particularly for people who are immunocompromised, children, people with cancer, people with AIDS, um, people with any of immune deficiency disorders. Um, sometimes in the parts per quadrillion, okay? So just because they're low concentrations doesn't mean it's safe. What and about her, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, she said something about it being, and I don't really understand, bioavailable, does that have to do with what you're talking about too? Um, that's a, diff a separate That's different, okay. Um, she said that there, there were so, so few carcinogens. A, a recent study, 2019, mm -hmm. this year, and again in a peer-reviewed journal, said um, in new crumb rubber, researchers identified 52 chemicals that were classified by EPA, and we're talking about this EPA under this administration, um, that were 52 chemicals classified as known, presumed, or suspected carcinogens. 52. And then there were hundreds that didn't have any, any data at all. So, you know, one of the other things that somebody said is certain towns are risk averse. My strong belief is that Easton should be a risk averse town. There's something that scientists talk about called the precautionary principle. If you're not sure, err on the side of safety. We're talking about our children, and not just our children, but the rest of the community. Because another study that the toxicologist neglected to mention was that um, it, it doesn't matter because kids will play away games on turf. This fixed the whole community. A 2018 study showed that infill particles were found in 85.4% of downstream sediment samples, as far away as 4.3 kilometers. These little pieces of rubber are not only becoming airborne, they are getting into the water supply up to 4.3 kil kil kilometers away. That doesn't just affect the people. I don't have kids in this school anymore. My kids went kindergarten through 12th grade. They were on those fields. I don't have a, a pony in that ball game. But I am concerned as a resident of this town who drinks this water. Um, and then, you know, Jane, you said um, that you thought that there was so much research done on this. There has been a lot of research done on this, and the problem is that they're finding things of concern. So in February of 2019, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry the ATDS dark hour. This is the agency who said with P with PFAS that let's hide this report because it's going to be a public relations nightmare. Let's not let people know that PFAS causes cancer. This agency just a few weeks ago said 
We did some preliminary results from a pilot scale study, and it indicates the need for further investigation for a select group of chemicals for which field users may be exposed. This was two weeks ago, okay? My company petitioned EPA to remove their approval of Crumb Rubber, and in 2013, they did. In 2015, the Consumer Product Safety Commission removed their approval. Just because we haven't proved the link between this stuff and cancer does not mean it's safe. And the last thing I'm going to say, because I know I've gone on a long time, is that there was just an article that came out. There are crumb rubber nanoparticles in this crumb stuff. Nanoparticles. It makes up more than 30% of car tires. That's a lot of nanoparticles. They just discovered, and this was um, just published in the issue of Current Biology. This is a medical journal. These nanoparticles behave just like asbestos. And they're saying this is going to be the next asbestos problem. We are going to see athletes who are breathing this stuff in and getting very ill. I understand we need fields for the kids to play in. I understand that there's money problems, but honestly, the safety of the people in this town needs to come first. But do you think that these these materials that are labeled organic right. are safe? We just we don't know anything about those either, and there's a particle issue with some of those as well. I don't know enough about those. I also am concerned about the sand, the sands in the rubber infill as well. Sand, so that kind of sand is not good to breathe. Um, so I don't know enough about that to say to say what the answer is. But what I'm saying is, is there not anything we can do to explore this further? Both the EPA is supposed to be coming out with their study this year, um, which I mean I don't know if I will trust it, but it's been going on for years now. So hopefully we can. And I, I, it. I just feel like we're making a mistake. So here's a question is, who's doing the studies on the PBIs? Where are those studies? I couldn't, I looked and could not find any scientific studies. So I saw the MSDS, the material safety data sheet mm -hmm. for um, the, what's the name of that company? Greenplay, is that what it's called? Greenplay. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing in it. They, so, no, I meant there was nothing, there were no, red flags, there was nothing in there. But they haven't done, as you can see from the crumb rubber, which has been around for decades, they still haven't done those studies. They still have not done determinative studies after decades. So expecting those studies to be around after five years. Is no, and that's, I think that's, that's a fair point. I think my concern with choosing one over the other is I can't say this other infill in the long run is going to be any safer because we don't know. It, we just don't know. It's cork and coconut, which the guy at Greenplay, Dominic, that I talked mm. to said that it was um, organic. So is it? I don't know. It's not approved by USDA. I mean, a lot of things aren't approved by USDA and people call them organic. Right. You could probably figure out if you sourced it. If I had to choose over from rubber and film, which has 50 known, known or suspected carcinogens as registered with EPA versus hopefully organic cork and, corn and uh, coconut husk, I would absolutely 100% go with the corn and coconut husk. Absolutely. Ms. Valley? I always think this third option is probably the most, the least popular here. But in all due respect, Donna Valley and I was on the finance actually when this turf was first brought in over grass and then I was on the school committee as well and back at that time it was absolutely not going to be approved unless the fundraising happened and the fundraising was supposed to cover the original turf the maintenance and the replacement so I'm a little boggled of why our tech pay dollars would be spent on this at all and not only that at the time there was a controversial issue with the red track because the cost ended up coming in lower than the original estimate. Instead of saving that money for the maintenance, which would have saved the taxpayers money, instead they spent the money on the red turf, which was not what was in the original proposal. 
So, and I hear everything you're saying, Carla, and it raises concerns for sure, but I am concerned that there's no history on this new stuff. The third option is go back to grass. I agree. <laughs> you know? I, I, I mean, this is crazy to be spending. What did we have? One is the organic We don't know enough. But, but so, a so from project of eight hundred thirteen thousand dollars that the town was never supposed to cover. So here's a, and I know it's not going to go over to like a lead balloon, right. but that's my. Opinion. But here's a, another question, and, and maybe it's, I think to assume that there's no risks associated with grass is perhaps not. There are different kinds of risks. Risk all. Right, Every exactly. There's risks, risks of, and, and I, I, I'm going to look at because we have a physician in the room, I don't know if Lori knows, but I, I would I don't know if grass, or you might know, has a higher risk of, does it have a higher risk of concussion rates? When it's not maintained, I think we saw the pictures of what the old field looked like. Yeah. <laughs> and it wasn't good. Okay. So I so again I do think that I think with so all of the alternatives. Cancer. Well, I'm sorry, could I just ask a question? My understanding was to go back to grass would actually be more expensive and that we'd only be able to use the field one third of the time that we currently use it. We Is that correct? Pull out all the stones yeah. that's underneath and then we install new with the import soil and so in terms of the money argument, <laughs> it, it doesn't work with I mean I I'm not saying I'm but it's one and done. It was the same. Uh yeah, to a degree that's true. But but um the, you know, in terms of the financial, I mean, what we're facing in terms, yeah, right yeah. now, the short-term cost financially. Yeah. Oh, I remember. Well, it was, it was like David, not, Mr. Tom, say it was a grass field yeah. because it, with, the, with the amount of pressure on it. Uh, I think well, every district could probably get to this uh, point uh, clearer than I can, but uh, if you put a natural grass field in there, yeah, uh, you're still going to have pesticides and uh, fertilizer. Which I know Castanich is just lady back here. Uh, just mentioned about um, Ron was mm -hmm. just found to have uh, be a Castanich. So if you put fertilizer and pesticides out there, I mean that's not a good thing either. So kind of like pick your poison. I don't really know uh, which way to go. I mean you can you can make pros and cons on each one of the different. Well, and I think that's what we've asked this group to do. We've asked them to look at pros and cons, right? Right. And, and just to return to the article that I referenced earlier, the Loudoun County Public Schools analysis, the sort of a white paper that they put out, but they talked about cork and that, um, first of all, it says that cork actually is one of those hardwoods that can pose significant risks, um, respiratory problem risks specifically. Um, it can cause hypersensitivity to pneumonia, which is alveolitis, I guess is the, how, the term. Um, and frequent attacks of this can cause lung scarring, fibrosis. Um, this is specific to certain kinds of hardwoods, including cork. I mean, cork and coconut sound so natural, but I, I just, everything I read uh, seemed to indicate that there were a lot of unknowns mostly unknowns mm -hmm. about, you know, the long-term impact of using that in so many ways, including any kind of future exposure. But, um, I mean, my main concern is I think the jury's still out on the new stuff. It's kind of still out on crumb rubber, but, it ha you know, we, as you pointed out, we don't use the old generation crumb rubber, which seemed to be more pro problematic in terms of the particle size, correct? I, I hope I'm <laughs> I got that right. But I just feel like we would be, in some respects, kind of saying we were willing to take a greater risk on an unknown quantity than a mild risk or whatever on a known quantity. I mean, we just, there's probably nothing that's perfect, including, from what I understand, a lot of natural grass fields are full of lead from many, many years of automobile you know, the gasoline, leaded gasoline kind of permeating the air and getting into the dirt. So, I, I mean, there's kind of nothing safe, and we certainly don't want our kids to stop playing. So, um, I don't know what this, I have the utmost respect for Kyla Bennett's expertise and her credentials, and I know that her passion is there, and I am so pleased that she cares for this community so much, but I just, 
I'm just not seeing it. I'm not seeing that the risk of crumb rubber is, you know, with evidence, unsafe compared to corconut. I'm not sure either is 100% safe. Nothing is. Have any other comments? You can think about it while I just go through. So how does the school committee fit into this decision? Um, we don't have authority over the day-to-day -day operations of the school, but we are responsible to keep the public informed, which we've done over the past year with our meetings. Um, we are responsible for the budget, which is why we voted on funding sources. As, um, as was mentioned, a portion of this project will be put in our capital budget request, which will be voted on a town meeting. A portion was requested to use CPA funding, which again will be voted on a town meeting. Um, and we have some uh, private fundraising that's going on and then um, some money from the athletic revolving account. We have said all along that none of the funds would come from the school's operating budget and that's the way it has to be. Um, but we have been asked to make a re recommendation on whether to proceed with the projects. My understanding would be the next step is if would you go out to bid and they'd have to have a, this is what the project scope is to go out to bid. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, any other questions well, or from comments a, from about a, that? From a funding perspective, too, I think the thing to think about, and I'm just thinking, I'm making a, a comparison to the MSBA, just because I've been dealing with the MSBA so much, is one of the things, if we were not to do this this year, hypothetically, and move it forward because we felt like we needed more time or there was going to be more information, my concern becomes the pool of things that is going to be on the list next year could look very different than the pool of needs that's on the list this year. And so this year, based on what our needs were and based on what the town needs were, there was capacity to, to put this on town warrant to bond. I don't know that we could guarantee that next year we'd be in the, a similar situation. You know, again, I'm thinking of depending on what ends up happening with the school project. Um, we could end up replacing a boiler next year. That may have to go on. Mm -hmm. There may be huge roof issues. That may have to go on. We may have, you know, I mean, we've been fairly fortunate. I'm using that term really loosely so far in terms of the, those primary schools as we've discovered issues with tiles and asbestos and what we need to do that to to remedy those remediate those situations but that could where we've been very very fortunate in little pieces could become a very big problem and that will happen quick and, and that's a huge amount of money I just I'm thinking about what the pool is like this year what it could like look like mm -hmm. next year so. so are you saying that we would really just make a recommendation in what way could well first of all I, I'd love to hear from both Nancy and Michelle what you think I mean I talk way too much myself so yeah. um like I didn't read as many articles as Caroline did, but <laughs> yeah, did. and I think I know more about crumb rubber than I ever thought I would know. When we've all said that, so I, I don't know. I think this um, activist group is that. Did I say it right? Yep. Um, has done a really nice job of informing us, and that the subcommittee here has really, you know, put a lot of time and effort into this. And we've had this field for nine, eight, ten. 10 years and I don't know it seems to be great to me so I'm I'm on the crumb rubber go with it and that's where I'm at and I understand but anything in life I mean there's risk like eating bacon or coffee or you know there's everything's got a risk so I I just feel like for the past 10 years we've done really well with these fields um, I want to thank you guys for I want to echo Jane. That there was a big piece that I was missing, was that the process and how you got there. I just felt like it was here, and I was missing that, and, and that really cleared me up for tonight. I want to thank um, Kyla, and we received a lot of emails from concerned yeah. yep. citizens, and I appreciate each and every one of them, and each and every question and point that was brought up. Um, and honestly, I'm on the minute I'm back and forth I'm seeing both points mm -hmm. but I also know it's there's a lot of monetary issues that go in with if we change um, and I think that it would be 
a real disservice to our students if we start sending them off to other fields and other um, venues. So I honestly don't know at this point, but I do appreciate both points of views, and I am listening to both. I think we both are listening. We all yeah, listen to both. Yeah, but I want the people who aren't here that have been writing to us mm -hmm. to know that I read every one of them. I yeah. just clicked on every link. Yeah. Um, and it is. It's hard. You read one thing and you think one thing, and then you read something else. Yeah. It's, it's <laughs> especially when you know we're not scientists, and so we are just trying to digest what the experts are telling us. Um, I don't think we need to vote on this since, again, we don't have day-to-day -day oversight. But I think we just need to come to a consensus about to give that to move the group forward. some direction. Um, do we have a consensus to move forward with the project as recommended? I think so. Yes. I think so. Yes. I think so. Okay. Which so what it means is we're I think we're giving them the authority to move forward and go out to bed. They're just going out to bed, and then obviously the next step. For the town is you know these these um, two funding sources will be for up for vote at town meeting and so I just think it might be important to be able to present the people at town meeting all the information as well so they can make informed decisions thank you very much oh dr. Hahn Yeah. Um, so we would probably go out to bid over the next week or so. Um, it would be about three week bid process. So the goal is to have hard bid numbers from contractors so we can present them a little bit at town meetings. So we're not just using an estimate. Um, and I think the schedule is probably about an eight week schedule for the whole construction process. So we would start shortly after the end of school, which is I believe June 23rd, around there. And I think we're looking to be done by August 15th or so, which would be right in time for um, fall practices. Does that cure anything? No, I mean, you know, weather will impact the infilling, so when the sand ru rubber go into the field, because um, the field can't be wet, because that infill needs to migrate down. And then for the track surfacing, they need some dry weather. So there could be a little bit of impact related to um, that. But what, you know, what, once all the surfaces are put down, there's not necessarily a cure period a lot of people get except for the track surfacing, you know, the, the day they paint the lawns, paint it on, you know, for a few hours, things like that. But there's certainly weather impacts that could delay, so that's why I watch I hit the ground run as soon as the, the season's over, or, you know, if we got there a little bit earlier to do some of the demo work, anything we can do to pick up, because we know there'll be some rain in the summer at some point. So we have to start with the private funding, right, because you won't have the funds available until the fiscal year. I know that's not really perfect, right. but... but but I think you know, obviously, all the funding needs to be in place. So we'll have the funding. Right. We'll but have the CP. The funding's in place. We'll have the town money wouldn't be available until July, right? The new fiscal year. Um, in the new fiscal year to bond it. Do you mean to to bond it out when they'll bond it out? Yeah, probably. But I don't know if there's something that that Connor can do to make those funds available yeah. once we vote for them at town meeting. <laughs> so Sorry. yeah. Typically, you don't pay. Like I don't, I don't think municipalities can pay contractors up front. Until the work is all completed, that's when you pay. Right. Okay. So even though so this is fiscal year process. starts July 1st, we're not allowed to pay until the project pretty much ends, which is like August 15th. And I'm just going to confirm, because we are looking at a timeline, and so the, the private fundraising will have to be pretty well done by the time this, this work is hitting the ground. And that's, you're on, you feel like you're on track for that right now? Absolutely. Great. We're yes. on track. Okay. I also just feel the need to, to at least tell you, um, and I think we've talked about it in the past, um, Friends of Easton raised $500,000 uh, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, six years ago, Friends of Easton donated the turf uh, to the town. Uh, at that time, there were questions, uh, some confusion regarding somehow that Friends of Easton made a commitment to raise funds in perpetuity. Um, people should understand that Friends of Easton for the last eight years has been me and a checkbook. Um, and the notion that an individual would somehow commit to raise $800,000 every 10 years for the yeah. town when their kids are 27 and 29 years old. Um, 
is not only not plausible, but was something that was spoken about on the record in the school committee meeting six years ago. Right. So um, the good news is uh, people, I think, in the town are very supportive. We've got sponsorships uh, from people uh, with regard to signs on the perimeter fencing, with regard to uh, the press box, um, significant um, uh, donations and sponsorships. And so at this point, uh, we're well within reach of the goal that we expect to uh, achieve, and we don't see any reason that we're, uh, we're not going to get there. Right. And so I'm going to just, so that we can be really clear, and we've, we've said this in school committee meetings, is first of all, we appreciate that you have continued to step up to the plate mm -hmm. and fundraise mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of maintain your commitment to this as you, the one guy with the checkbook. I am going to go back to um, what Donna Abelli talked about and what Caroline and I have some pretty direct experience with, um, as well as probably Lori and Colleen Less is originally Fred, when the Friends of Eastham was just formed, and it wasn't just one guy with a checkbook, there were conversations and commitments made. And and I and I don't think Fred was I, I, there. I, I, you I, probably I think, weren't I even involved. John, I, you're probably yeah. talking about John Howell. Right, thank you. Yeah. I don't even John, think John you were involved. A, a job in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. Yeah. And you were left with the, you were left with the, exactly. So. And so I, I think I, I need to be clear that, that there was some history, but we're not, you know, no, I, look, I, okay. I, I, I understand that, okay. but you know, we donated the field six years ago and had that discussion. Yep. And, Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I remain committed. I've told you why. I don't need to repeat that. Um, it's uh, personal for me. Um, but you know, as I said, uh, I think there's great people in this town, yep. amazing people that step up and uh, are willing to, to help us with kids that are that are long gone. Uh, the utilization uh, that, the, that the, the field provides, uh, Bill and all the teams that he's trying to support is. Uh, is crucial and, uh, and and we're going to get the money there's no question Thank you. Uh, and I, I mean I think we all so appreciate your right. involvement and mm -hmm. and recognize that you, you were not <laughs> responsible for the sort of misunderstanding on the part of the sure. committee yeah, um, no you know so well and I, I we've had that experience on more than one occasion where where really well-intentioned people will step up to, to volunteer to fun, fundraise and support something for a period of time, but then after a period of time, there those people are gone and new people haven't stepped in, and those commitments end up being assumed in our operating budget. So, which we cannot do. This day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Again. Okay, next item on the agenda, um, Thank you. public hearing on school choice. Okay, and then we will have a discussion and possible vote on school choice. So school choice, do you want to just describe a little bit what it is? Sure. <laughs> All right. Sc school choice is an option that um, each district needs to pursue each year to um, they, the, each district needs to vote on each year to see if um, they will allow students from another district into their district at no cost to the well there is a no cost to the housing district correct right. Um, right. it is something that the school committee needs to vote on each year it's up to the school committee the sole discretion of the school committee um, whether or not they would like to allow school choice. School choice can be a district option, it could also be a grade level option, and can also be limited to a particular number as well. Yeah, this is interesting. So if more students apply, then there are slots, a lottery can be used. Mm -hmm. If you allow school choice one year, you're not obligated for subsequent years. However, once a child is admitted to a district through school choice, that child re may remain there through high school. Okay. District is not responsible for tr uh, transportation, and the rate is capped at $5,000 for the receiving school. <clears throat> there are several districts that um, do participate. There are several districts that do not. Easton has not participated in the past. Um, I don't know if anyone has any um, comments on whether or not they think we should participate. Well, I've, I've never supported it, but mostly because we we really don't have, certainly in our elementary schools, we don't have room. But um, 
and we have very large class sizes at this point in the high school. Luckily, we're bringing them down a bit in the middle school, but we, it's not like we have a lot of spare space. Right. And um, right now, with our own budget situation right. uh, so precarious, and the fact that you actually bring in far less per choice student than the per pupil amount for the students who are already here, it just doesn't make sense either financially or in terms of space to mm -hmm. me, and it continues to be the, that case yeah. for me. So Yeah, I don't think Agreed. the circumstances have changed from last year to this year or from the year before or the year before or the year before. Mm -hmm. I think the circumstances right. have, have remained the same, right. so I can't see any reason why we would vote vote to become a school choice district. Well, this is a public hearing, so if does anyone in the public have an opinion on this or a question about this? Okay, no, no one has raised their hand. So um, I will make a motion that the Eastern Public Schools will not participate in school choice for the 2019-20 school year. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Next item on the agenda. Um, Item number seven, which is discussion and possible vote regarding foreign exchange students. I'm gonna make a motion to table this item. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Next item, schedule of the school committee meetings for 2019 and 20, second reading. Mrs. Pruitt? <laughs> so, before you, you have the schedule of school committee meetings. Um, there are, there, you'll see some options in red in December where you will need to choose from one of these dates for a meeting. Um, there's also some time changes at the bottom. Um, typically, we meet one Thursday evening a month at 6.30. However, those two options are at 6 o'clock. Um, the other, we also meet one Friday a month, and those times vary whether it's 9.15 in the morning or 3 p.m. in the afternoon. So the first ones we need to, we need to choose one from the December dates, is that right? Yes. I would like to um, suggest December 5th. Um, I know I have a commitment on December 12th. I mean, it could be December 11th also, but I'm thinking in terms of Thursdays, December 5th. Are any of these days concert dates from the schools? I don't think that has been set yet. And, and plus, we can't always avoid yeah. every school activity for our meetings. I mean, it's just impossible. Mm. And, you know, sometimes, occasionally, a school committee member misses a meeting or sometimes they miss a, an event. Um, the fifth, the, the only issue I see with the fifth is that then is, is over a month before our next meeting. And in my experience, things always crop up in between. But, oh, you mean but between I mean, the fifth and January, and January 9th? January 9th, yeah. Right. So it's, it's actually. Uh, a pretty long time between, but but I I mean I don't that's really, right because we only I, have one meeting in December, right. right? Right. So I don't otherwise have any objections, but um, I mean did, I, I wouldn't mind the eleventh. But did we want to add in a Friday meeting in December? Um, Are you suggesting in lieu of the no uh, no, meeting? but I mean we could uh, well, we des we December fifth or eleventh. So, so we would have to be the fifth. We have to be the thirteenth because the twentieth. That's really the start winter break, right. mm -hmm. so it would have to be on the 13th. So Friday the 13th. Well, could we go with the 5th since Nancy said she is, um, she She's has a, a commitment, commitment on, on the 12th. 12th. And then, you know, we can, as we get closer, we can know whether we need to try to schedule a Friday. Sure. And we can schedule it in December, right? Uh -huh. I mean, we can just do it then. Sure. Does so. that work for everybody? I don't know why I'm looking Doesn't at you. Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Jane, what do you want to do? Jen. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, all right, so we'll do the December 5th for that. And then did you, did, was there a question about the times in May and June? No, those are just highlighted because, because those are time changes. Right, because those are the school presentations. Well, those are the yeah. 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 And, okay. and isn't there usually an October meeting where we start early because it's the, it's not really school committee, but it's the uh, professional, professional status. status. Professional status. That would status, be October right. 3rd. Yeah. Yeah. It's not actually the meeting yeah, that's yeah. starting. I know, but, right. yeah, but you're right. Yeah. 
That's right. Okay. So should it be listed at six o'clock? No. No. Uh, so okay. it's five, leave it at six. Yeah. yeah. Leave it there's, there's, but then there's like an yeah. agenda. Right. Yeah, okay. yeah. Yeah. We'll get notification. Okay. Probably be five thirty. Okay. Public comment? Anyone? 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 Assistant superintendent notes. Sure, I have three things I just want to highlight. Well, this so, is, the, I'm sorry, this is the second reading of the school committee. Oh, oh so we have to be devoted. I'm sorry. sorry. I'm you sorry, are right. I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay. <laughs> nope. Go back. I'm going to, somebody want to make a motion to accept our school committee meeting schedule? All so favor. moved. Second? Second. All in favor? There you go. Thank you, Caroline. Um, Assistant Superintendent. No. Sure. So we had this past Sunday, we had 14 girls from Oliver Ames attend the Girls STEM Summit at Wentworth Institute of Technology. This event was held uh, this past Sunday, like I just said, March 31st. And the purpose of the event was to inspire girls to pursue STEM fields. You can see a picture of the girls on my Twitter feed, which is at Assistant Soup Easton. It was so wonderful that they were able to attend. Mary Romans, our math department chair, um, attended the event with, with our students. So it was absolutely wonderful. There was also the 84 movement at the State House yesterday. So in collaboration with the Easton Wings of Hope, students from Oliver Ames were at the State House working on raising awareness of the importance of preventing tobacco use among teens. Students received leadership development training on meeting with public officials, as well as had face-to-face -face meetings with state representatives and senators, and Senator Timulty actually just commented on it um, this evening when I spoke with him before yeah. the meeting, right. and how wonderful the Oliver Ames students were and how attentive they were to all the topics as well. And we have m many wonderful arts nights happening around the district over the next month, so keep your eye open for them. Tonight was EMS, and I'm very sorry that I wasn't able to attend the East End Middle School Art Event. That's all I have for this evening. Thank you. Um, school committee notes? Um, I just want to give folks a heads up reminder. I know we all got the invitation for senior projects, which mm -hmm. is this Sunday. Sunday. Um, and, I, and I just want to comment real quickly and to thank, um, I think it's Craig Goldberg, who is the, mm -hmm. I know it's Craig who teaches that class. I had the pleasure this week, um, first I went to um, Jonathan Tolub's um, concert. John, it, Jonathan composed an original piece of music and actually put together a program where other students composed music and then he also put together an orchestra and they played his original piece. Um, and then yesterday I just went to another presentation from another one of the seniors. Her name is Kayla Brawley and she actually has been working all this year with a music professor um, from the University of Arizona mm -hmm. and um, she had put together two proposed high school courses. She researched the curriculum, she looked wow. at how she would, you know, put the courses together. They were very inter interdisciplinary. Um, she talked about how she would appeal to students, you know, from um, science and math and the music. Um, one was a music engineering course, one was a hip hop course. And those were just two little samples of the great work that that senior project is. I really, there's a huge part of me that wishes every single senior in our high school could have that opportunity because I actually think, um, particularly when you're a senior, as you're checking out, um, <laughs> this is something that really has clearly kept those kids engaged. Mm -hmm. um, so if there was ever any way we could um, could expand expand that and you know I, I do know that we offer community service right now and a lot of our students take advantage of community service I think in some ways the senior project I see is is a much more valuable um, learning mm -hmm. opportunity for mm -hmm. our kids so, so I'm just yeah. I'm just gonna say I'm wondering <laughs> Not to dis Maybe we could have our students teach some of these courses. Well, save us a lot of money, <laughs> and you know they. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how the union would feel about that, but yeah. since we can't afford to hire new teachers that could create these wonderful, was, or you know, could could teach these wonderful courses. Um, I mean, this isn't as crazy as it sounds. Mm -hmm. I actually remember uh, many years ago, a wonderful uh, elementary teacher, Ginny Elson let my daughter come in and for a whole semester teach environmental science in her class. That was her project, her independent yeah. study project. 
and she developed a whole curriculum and she taught it every week, once a week, for I think the whole year actually. And mm -hmm. she loved it, the kids loved it, Ginny Elson loved it. I mean, it was, it was just a, a, you know, it's not that crazy to think that we have so many talented and brilliant high school students. Yeah. If they could kind of share their creativity and um, ideas with mm -hmm. other students, it, it's not that wild an idea, especially for a budgetarily challenged district. <laughs> I think you'll see with the change in um, frameworks for the social studies standards, there is a service project orient. Uh, huh? They're very service project oriented, especially at the high school, and it, it, they are looking to make a project mandate for oh. the high school That's students. Great. That's great. So I think you're on to something. <laughs> <laughs> A pro I mean, I think Jane's I talking mean, about yes, a, a project, project that would be like, but but I, I'm not necessarily thinking it should always be a service, service. project. Mm -hmm. I mean, community service, of course, is something that's important and we want to encourage it, but I wouldn't want to see it limited to that because what Craig Goldberg does with these other projects, they're not, per some of them are service. effectively community service of sorts, but many of them aren't, but they're still tremendously enriching and, you know, well, Productive. my point was, I saw two. They were wonderful. I'm sure that the rest, mm -hmm. when, if we go on Sunday, will be just yes. as, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. they were just really good. Any other comments? Um, I just want to um, congratulate Jane from me, my <laughs> partner over here. And uh, we'll miss you. And I've been on both, you know, when I was on the teacher's side and then here. You've been a very good influence on the school <laughs> committee. So we're going to miss you. Thanks. But we're not going to miss you because anywhere. we're going to see you. Right. Okay. I'm falling off and we're going to welcome Jen with open arms. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Be positive. Jane, you want to close us out? Well, can I just, oh, sure. yeah. I just say yeah. one last thing? I'm sorry. On, on behalf of Dr. Cabral and myself, um, I meant to say this in the assistant superintendent notes, but overlooked it. I apologize. But... <laughs> It has been such an honor sitting next to you, my, my partner, my, my neighbor, um, sharing notes, passing notes. Um, but also, my experience with you, Jane, over the past couple of years is you have been a true champion for all children, and you will be greatly missed. And I really thank you for your leadership, thank your you. mentorship, and it has been an honor to work with you. Thank so you. thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. This, this was really wonderful, and I, I so appreciate everything that everybody said but really let's be honest we could do the same thing for everybody who has often sat at this table so i mm. i really appreciate it yeah you're pretty special yeah. Yeah. I'd, say, I'd say so yes <laughs> definitely so, make a motion to i'd like to make a motion to adjourn second uh, all in favor nobody raise their hands <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you. Good night.